All right, my good friends, this is Mr. Davis. I know um, you are flying out of your bed right now, hearing my voice again, I am sure. Uh, I'm just making a little lecture with a video. I'm going to put it up on Edpuzzle. You would know that because it's where you are at right now. I also will um, put a link to the video on YouTube in case you're having problems with Edpuzzle. I'm not really sure why some people uh, seem to have problems with it, um, but I do know once you work with it a little bit more, um, you get more figured out. I think if you use it on different computers, you're supposed to be signed into your Google account. So maybe that's an issue. I'm not really sure because I can't see it on your end, but um, I know it does seem like it's working in a lot of classes. So I think this is the first geography video that I'm going to uh, send to you through Edpuzzle. So we're going to actually move away from Europe and we're going to what is known as East Asia. If we were taking a map quiz, it's like literally impossible for me to give you a map quiz um, at home and for you not to get a thousand out of a thousand on a map quiz. Um, so uh, we will have quizzes in here. We'll have some vocab quizzes and just like basically just keeping you honest type of work and, and giving you assessments. But map assessment um, is not really a great way. I guess the only way I could do it is... Uh, just put a time limit on it and show you different country shapes, but I digress. If we were in class, we would be having map quizzes. We are not in class physically, but uh, we will do them. Uh, we'll have we'll have different types of quizzes. All right, so we're going to move over from Europe to East Asia. This is pretty cool. I like this part to talk about because it's just one, Mongolia, two, China, three, North Korea, four, South Korea, five, Japan, and then six Taiwan. So there's only six nations. We can we will watch a video on every nation. We're going to start with Japan today. We've already talked extensively about China. We also we are going to look at their uh, ghost towns in China, and we've heard of the rock band Who, the Mongolian rock band. So this is where our good friend Genghis Khan was from, up in the steppes of Mongolia, the Gobi Desert. Today, uh, even though their neighbors are the biggest country in the world, Mongolia has half the amount of people that. Kentucky has. It only has like two and a half million people. Their capital is Ulaanbaatar. They're trying to get people to move there and uh, create this big world-class city, which is, is a world-class city, a, a capital, but uh, it's it's landlocked. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Most of the country is desert, so that's why um, you know they have a small population. But let's get to it. First of all, what the heck has been going on at the Davis household? Um, the Davis household has been crazy. My wife is a, a teacher as well, special education teacher. So she is taking care of business uh, all school day. There, She has to meet with students all day long on the computer. So who is the teacher? It is not uh, Miss Sandra. It is Mr. Davis cracking the whip on these young guns here. Uh, this is Will uh, trying to tell me. Count to 10 here. Um, this is Will trying to uh, circle all the M's for Mommy. And this is K-Dog down here, um, and he is playing with Play-Doh. That is a lot of fun when you become a parent, is playing with Play-Doh and, wait for it, wait for it, cleaning up from Play-Doh. It's awesome. Um, but we got some boxes that they can kind of keep their Play-Doh in and uh, – as you can see, Daddy hasn't quite gotten them out of their jammies for the day. They're Kentuckians. They're barefoot hillbillies there. I have a pretty sweet picture of Kevin. We're trying to, like, get Kevin potty trained before the age of two, which is pretty tough. Um, I believe, though, Mr. Shu was potty trained really early. That's a good fact of the day. I think before he was two, Mr. Shu was potty trained. He was telling me that when we were talking about the trials and tribulations of potty training. But... Um, just too much information for the day. Kevin poops standing up. Like he uses all of his leg muscles to go poo poo. And so he really likes to go poo poo right now in the potty because uh, Mickey and Woody call him up on the phone and tell him to keep working at it. The problem though is when he sits down, he doesn't have those leg muscles anymore. His, his little feet can't push off the ground so that's your too much information my wife would probably kill me if i was you know i was telling you about our potty trouble 
but uh, that's what's going on in the Davis household. So it's all crazy, you know. All right. So the countries we're talking about, I already told you about that. So China, uh, their capital is Beijing, Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, North Korea, Pyongyang, South Korea is Seoul, South Korea. Uh, not like the Seoul we spell out, but S E O U L. Uh, Taiwan, Taipei, and Japan, Tokyo, where the Tokyo Games have been, uh, they've been pushed back a year. Um, now, if any time pictures cover up text, it is because um, it has been converted from a PowerPoint to a Google Slide, and that's oftentimes what they do. Here it is, uh, this is, I always find this picture interesting, made in China, American flag. Uh, last Olympic Games or the games that were in London, we marched into uniforms made from China. Um, here's the Great Wall of China. Um, it is called the world's longest cemetery because when the workers in China made it, they just worked till they died. And then instead of having a nice proper burial, they just threw them in the mortar of the wall and, you know, just, you know, help solidify their wall, their bones. Um We'll move on. Some fun facts about East Asia. China's ethnic group is from the Han Dynasty, makes up 94% of their population, which you actually already know. This guy right here is, these two guys are called Bob. Um, this is the DMZ. Bob stands up here on top of these steps in the North Korean side of the DMZ, and he just looks at the South Koreans all day long, doesn't move a muscle. They don't know his name. They just call him Bob. Um, China leased Hong Kong to the British for 99 years. In AP World said we're learning about um, the uh, Chinese uh, were just crushing everybody in terms of production in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s. What happens in China, though, is that they don't want to play with the rest of the world. They want everybody out of their sandbox. So they um, have an isolationist policy where they don't let anybody in and out. In fact, there's only like really one city, the port city of Canton, where they let Europeans trade. Uh, unfortunately for the Chinese, I think I've said that a few times, is that um, they don't get industrialized. And the British come back with big, huge ships and say, do you want to trade with us or do you want to go to war with us? And they have a series of wars called the Opium Wars in China um, because the British didn't have anything to offer in terms of goods that they produced. So they sold the Chinese people drugs called opium and got their population hooked. So long story short, China eventually agrees to give up parts of their territory. They agree to trade with uh, the Europeans and the British actually get the big territory of Hong Kong. They gave it back right at the turn of the 21st century. That is where all the protests have been going on and you know why they gave it when they gave it back, the British said, hey, we'll give this back to you, but you have to make sure this remains a capitalist society. So it's called uh, two countries, I'm sorry, one country, two systems was like kind of the terminology they used, meaning mainland China is communist, Hong Kong is capitalist. Uh, North Korea and South Korea are, um, have this two and a half mile DMZ. It's actually like one of the, in geography terms, it's one of the world's, most pristine environment because nobody uh, operates there. They don't build anything there. So it's like a nature preserve um, for the most part. Um, Chinese government rules Taiwan. We'll talk about that. The Mongols built the largest empire in history. Uh, the Japanese favorite sports are baseball and sumo wrestling. So I'm not a sumo wrestling expert. Neither is Kevin or Will, but I don't think it's going to end up very good for this bro down there. Okay, so more facts. About 70% of all the Chinese live in rural villages. If you drew a line here, you would say everybody in China lives on the eastern half of China. Almost no one lives out here. The Chinese are trying to build um, cities, ghost towns out here um, to send some of this red area out into the, the middle of the countryside to kind of... Uh, spread out the population a little bit. Um, cities we heard about, uh, Wuhan is right down here. Beijing is up here. Uh, there's some other major Chinese cities. Um, Japan is another very, very densely populated place because it's a thin island. It's kind of like California, 
if California was broken off and was an island. Um, Tokyo is one of the biggest cities in the world. Usually it bounces back uh, and forth between like Tokyo and Mexico City is some of the biggest cities in the world. Um, so, and that's what this, this bullet point says right there. Um, this is just, again, this is probably what I should have been talking about. Another country down here, the U.S. controlled for a while after the Spanish-American War was the Philippines, named after King Philip um, from Spain when the Spanish conquered it. Um, but that is not in this East Asia unit. Neither is Vietnam and Cambodia, those places. that We actually break it down into East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. Now, India and China are technically neighbors, like right here. Um, but there, there's not big, like, pot. what's funny about it is that a lot of people here in India, not a lot of people in this part of China. So uh, India is kind of an anomaly because uh, they have people living in their entire country almost. What I mean by that is that uh, is very, very densely populated. Like China, world's, world's biggest population, nobody lives out here. Nobody lives up here. India, second biggest population. Almost everybody in uh, India, uh, well, I should say not almost everybody, right? doesn't make sense, but they are very uh, spread out in India. They have people everywhere. Um, they speak English, a lot of them, and that is why you get so many calls um, from people maybe working, excuse me, in India because they speak English, they can communicate with us. They are mostly Hindus. They are mostly atheists. It is a communist nation. They are not a communist nation. India is the world's largest democracy, actually. Okay, the physical geography. We talked about the Gobi Desert. We talked about the Great Wall of China. There's a myth that you can see the Great Wall of China from outer space. They say it's not tall enough and not wide enough to be seen from outer space like like a coastline would be um, no part of mongolia is less than 1700 feet um, this uh, picture covers up the fact that japan is thousands of islands um, and this is tokyo here it is on the eastern edge of japan Okay, and it is pretty far north. We're going to look at what's called a sister city in a moment. Okay, um, just some other facts in the world that China is the largest country in the world. Their life expectancy, I believe now, is like 76 and not 74. Um, Mongolia only has four people per square mile, which is very, very sparsely populated. I want to say, I want to say in Campbell County, we have like, um, 600 people per square mile. I might be off on that. I got to double check my math. Don't hold me to that or look it up. You could look that up. All right. So here we're going to start with our first video of this is of Japan. This was a tsunami. Sounds like it should start with an S, but the T is silent. They have tsunami drills like we would have um, tornado drills is like would be the most uh, comparable drill that we have. What their goal is, um, if I had to ask you to raise your hand, um, Parker Lozier might tell me that the goal is to get to the highest point pos as possible. And like that would be like us getting on our roof. Like there would be a way, an access point to get onto a roof. And tsunamis are created by underwater earthquakes. So they do have centers that can give you some warning. And every day, technology gets better, and they can give us more and more warning about when a tsunami might affect an area. It doesn't matter to the landscape if you can really predict a tsunami. What it matters to are the humans. Like, can you get to the highest point? We have tsunamis in our countries. And if I called on Ryan Branch, she would be able to tell me that Hawaii would be somebody that's concerned about tsunamis. Alaska, if I called on Ryan uh, Ebert, and if I called on Taylor Decker from A period, she would be able to tell me that um, you know, maybe Washington might be worried about tsunamis, not as much as Hawaii or Alaska would. So this was, believe it or not, was a town protected by a seawall, but they're going to tell us that no matter what, the sea can always throw up a bigger wall. So we're going to go ahead and watch this video. It'll be the 
first country we look at in this region is Japan. This will probably be me almost done with talking, and you're just going to watch this video. It's about 11 minutes, so we will watch it. I'll just pause this here. Apologize. No matter how many reports you've heard, it's a shock when you get there. It wasn't the nuclear disaster or the powerful earthquake that swept the northeast coast of Japan into the sea. It was a tsunami, a black wave darker than a nightmare. No town was hit harder this past March than Atsuchi. In a matter of minutes, at least 1,500 people out of a population of only 15,000 were lost. Atsuchi is so remote very few people ever get there. But 14 years ago, a group of Americans formed a bond with the town, a bond that has only grown deeper since the tragedy. The world was so mesmerized by the nuclear accident that after a while, these coastal towns were forgotten. We went to Otsuchi ourselves to see what has become of a town that's on the brink of extinction. The story will continue in a moment. There, just in time to witness a haunting ceremony. Drum beats for the dead. Buddhist monks march through the remnants of this 800 year old town, chanting for requiem. Patucci reminds one of Hiroshima 66 years ago. Nature can be as vicious as an atomic bomb. 10% of the population was wiped out. It was a fatal lesson in the fragility of civilization. The earthquake alone was so powerful, it actually lowered the ground level of Japan and moved the entire island eastward by eight feet. Every day, high tide brings a flood. Even months later, the survivors are still living in temporary housing. But everyone understands temporary can last a long time. This is Otsuchi before the tsunami, and this is when Otsuchi stopped, 3.25 p.m., March 11, 2011. This is my house. That's your house. Yeah. Ken Sasaki works for City Hall in a city which has disappeared. How long had you been living here? Uh, over 20 years. And now, when you came back here the first time after the tsunami, was there anything of yours left here? Nothing was left. Ken was in a meeting near the harbor when the earthquake struck. 30 minutes later, he heard an ominous noise coming from the ocean. Oh, it must be tsunami. I have to run to uh, up hill. And then I turned back. That was so... That must was... have looked like hell. Yeah, it must be the hell. Nine of his relatives were killed by the tsunami. Aunts, cousins... Kenson, as he's known, had to live out of his car for three weeks. It was, it was so cold. And then, you know, there was no gas, no whiskey, no beers. <laughs> Kenson is as unique a character as you'll find in Japan. A music lover and guitar player, he learned English listening to the Beatles. The ocean has taken things away from Kenson before. When he was two, Kenson's father died off of Tucci's coast in a fishing accident. When he was a boy, Kenson would gaze out to sea looking for his father. He always wondered what was on the other side of that ocean. When he grew up, he took out an atlas and traced his finger across the Pacific. It landed on the town of Fort Bragg, California. Across the ocean, so there are uh, uh city of Fort Bragg. It's a straight line. Yeah. Had you ever heard of Fort no, Bragg? No, no, no. I oh. only heard about the San Francisco, California <laughs> like that. And then I tried to find out uh, what kind of city is Fort Bragg. What did you find out? It is uh, the world's largest salmon barbecue. The world's largest uh, salmon, salmon barbecue. barbecue? Right, right. That's quite a distinction. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so as you see, our town has a the big salmon history. Two salmon towns. Yeah. 
Oh, it is nice. Ken Sohan wanted to get to know this Fort Bragg Californian, so in 1997, he sent a fax to Fort Bragg City Hall inviting the mayor to Otuchi for a marine convention. Much to his surprise, the mayor said, okay. It was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. The two salmon towns started an exchange program. For 10 years, people shuttled back and forth across the Pacific. During their last visit to Otsuchi, the folks from Fort Bragg held their going away party inside a tourist boat, just five months before all parties stopped. After the tsunami, did you get messages from Fort Bragg? So many people send me many, many emails. That makes me cry, you know. Made you cry? Yeah, I feel so happy to get a many messages from Fort Bragg, my friends. One of those friends was Sharon Davis. At our invitation, she came back to Otsuchi and thought she knew what awaited her. Yeah, I've seen the pictures and the videos, but this is infinitely worse. She was particularly concerned about Kenson, the man who had first brought Otsuchi and Fort Bragg together. Kenson, it's so yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know you lost all your guitars in the tsunami. No way. It's for you. Oh, really? Yes. Last year, Sharon hosted two Otuchi students, Sadako and Nana, at her home in California as part of the exchange program. They survived the tsunami, heard Sharon was in town, heard she was coming to their school. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the sun coming out from behind the clouds. It was beautiful. <laughs> girls are okay? They are. They're okay. They're strong girls. And for what they've been through, it, it really amazes me. Sharon brought a thousand letters from kids back in Fort Bragg. <laughs> <laughs> Very frightening. But some of the reunions were tough. So tough that when a Tucci school superintendent spotted Sharon, he tried hard to smile, but couldn't pull it off. <laughs> Sharon expressed her sorrow in Japanese, and she gave a Tucci's vice mayor a gift. Oh, thank you. A picture of his former boss, the mayor. Atucci's mayor didn't survive the tsunami. He stayed in his second floor office at City Hall, orchestrating the evacuation. And he told his staff to evacuate to the roof. He stayed on the second floor and was killed by the tsunami along with about 20 of his other staff. The people who made it up to the roof were saved? Yes. Can't think of a better word, heroism. He died a hero. Otsuchi, like every village along the coast, had a seawall, but the sea can always throw up a higher wave. Otsuchi's wall fared no better than a sand castle built by children on a beach. The tsunami was so furious, it picked up boats from the sea and dropped them on roofs. And this one picture of this one boat has come to stand for the entire Japanese tragedy. That has become the boat, hasn't it? It's the iconic image from this event. And the last time you were here, you were laughing and dancing on that boat. We were. <laughs> it was the boat that had hosted Fort Bragg's farewell party five months earlier. It won't be seeing the sea again. It's being turned into trash. Occasionally, you spot old people wandering through the wasteland, looking for something they'll never find. But bodies were still being found while we were there, three months after the tsunami. Officially, the death toll in Otsuchi is put at 1,500. Think that's accurate? I really don't. And I think that it has a lot to do with uh, the way the Japanese specify whether or not a person is missing. And until somebody reports them missing, they are not statistically missing. So in this case, if an entire family was lost, there's no one left to report someone missing. It's not only people, memories are missing. 
family histories washed up in the rubble. Every Saturday, photographs found in the wreckage are displayed at the high school. The new sister, a haircut. Happiness is recovering one's past. Clearing all the debris will take years. Sometimes it's lifted by what look like prehistoric creatures. Sometimes it's lifted by hand. These people belong to the Fishermen's Union. They're cleaning up the beach by the seawall just to let them down. This isn't an exercise bike. It's a gas station. Keep pedaling, keep pumping. The signs say, never give up. The Japanese never have in the past, but this one is a bit much. They're getting a little help from their friends, though. Well, we're sending the money. The people of Fort Bragg, population 7,000, have raised $180,000 for a Tucci. There was no paper, no cards left in town, so they wrote their thank you note on all they had left, a talk. Looking at the people of Otsuchi, you'd never know what they'd been through. In Japan, exhibiting one's trauma is not considered polite. Sitting here looking at all this desolation, knowing that you lost everything you had. If you keep on smiling, how do you do that? I can't cry, you know. <laughs> I don't want to cry. So we need a smile, we need a laughing. Around here, we had a... Before we left, Ken-san wanted to show us something sprouting in the dust that was once his home. Yeah, look, look this. A new hydrangea plant. This is a kind of a hope. It's a life. You don't know when your house will be rebuilt, but when it is, yeah. you're going to replant the hydrangea. Yeah, I hope so. We are living. There's new life here. Yes. All right, um, let's see. That will be the end of the uh, lecture today. I hope you guys have a good weekend. This uh, lecture questions will be due on Monday at 9 o'clock.